welcome back. In this video, we're going to be fixing everything down and creating a working chronological engine. I have managed to get Araldite over everything. All my fingers, the bits of wire, the tables, my clothes, everything. Because I mixed up a whole load of them, it rather. So I can glue the two sockets I need, those lovely round pin ones that fit perfectly into plumbing fittings with copious amounts of glue as always. And because it's five minute epoxy and it's a hot day, absolutely no time. Talk about panic stations. I'm not even going to try and get this off. I don't know what the solvent is, but I'm going to wait for it to dry. It'll only take five minutes and then I can peel it off with a bit of luck. That's what I'm talking about. That sort of round pin plug socket thing. Brilliant. Got these pipes together now. Isn't that lovely? I'm just resting them here to keep everything flat. And wires. Got that socket in there. That's beautiful. We've got the power wires, the red, black. We've got the wires from the encoder, black, orange, purple. And we've got the wires from the bell motor, red and grey. And the good thing is all the blacks go to 0 volts, all the reds go to plus 5 volts, and the other ones go where hopefully I've made a note they should go. I'm having to do it like this because otherwise I'm not going to be able to thread all the wires through this bend and then into the clock. So I want to get them all poking through before I finally fix this into place. Oh, I forgot the PIR sensor. This is another three wires. All feeding through. Lovely spiral protective stuff. Probably not necessary, but why not? Lovely. Look at that difference. That's so much fun to put on. Finally getting it all lined up, the Munson rings clamped down, the engraving, there's a little bell at the back. Oh, how lovely, and all the wires going inside. Next thing, sort out this lovely coiled copper pipe. Getting it fixed onto there and onto there. Onto there, with some beautiful little end feed fittings. These are actually eight millimetre, and I've just remembered this pipe is 6.5 a quarter inch. Uh, but I've also just remembered that cutting some six millimetre, <laughs> what am I talking about? Eight millimetre pipe just fits over here, so I can make little adapters up. There we are, so eight millimetre copper D bird just fits over perfectly the quarter inch. And then these beautiful little fittings go onto the 8mm bit. The 8mm is what I used for the barometric prognosticator 3, the small um, copper pipe work, the larger being 15. Also cut out two bits of acrylic. I couldn't work out what they're for. They're for this. The 8mm pushes in there, and then that glues beautifully into the 15mm copper fitting. Cluttered, you say? No, homely, I answer. Right. Now today's job is to get, we've got this pipe, the power pipe that goes to the USB adapter. Now I need, I've arranged these carefully, the right, the correct uh, spacing as required by the customer. Now I'm going to work out the length of the tube to go from there to there, and from there to, where is it, there. Because I've got all the sockets and everything made up. So let's get measuring and arranging. A bit of lateral thinking is necessary because obviously I want the, the tubes to hang vertically and that wasn't possible. So, da, 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 why didn't I think of this before? Six screws in the front of the hanging shelf, all nicely arranged, distance is correct, height's all the same. Now I can actually hang the pipes down and get a better feel and be able to judge exactly how long they need to be. I've got them lined up and luckily I can get both of the pipes out of one piece of one length of it. Wrapped a bit of masking tape around it, put it in a vise gently and used a junior hacksaw just to saw through it. Cuts really quite cleanly and evenly and doesn't suddenly spring and unfurl. Now, this is why we glued these onto them yesterday having cut off the flange that I mentioned once before. These are tap connectors, end feed to 15mm tap connectors because these happen to fit perfectly over there. In fact, no, they don't. I need to cut a collar of 15mm copper pipe because the copper pipe fits perfectly over there. And then I'm going to cover myself in epoxy resin again. This is what I'm talking about. There's a piece of 15mm copper tube. 
I've deburred one end and left the little flange, the sharp bit that's left when you cut these because this is the end, one of the cut ends. You can see it doesn't unravel. If you twist it in a whatever way to close the spring up a bit, it just, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? It's just, now I can, I'll can glue that in. Probably use super glue to be honest with you, but I might stick with Araldite as it's more messy. And then of course, that's the right size to push into and to glue into the tap fitting with the plug on it. Right, I'll get them done. Shows you how brilliant this antique shower hose is. It's absolutely made for this. It's fabulous. And if you shop around, obviously if you look on Amazon and eBay, you'll find a piece of this that's sort of like £35 or something ridiculous. But if you continue searching, you can find it, I think, probably about £5.50 each. And it's all pretty standard if the antique look is right. And you get the lovely piece of rubber tube that you can take out of the middle of it. These are gluing together. Beautiful. One thing to take care of is that when you glue them together, you do remember to get all the captive fittings on. I uh, you know from experience, beautiful glue job, but then you have to take it all to pieces. So that's good. Now it's time to put one of those to here and connect the inside to the climatic revelator. Um, and it's typical, isn't it? I knew, I knew this had happened, but somewhere there, there, there is a blemish. I've tried wiping it off gently, nothing. Right in the middle, in the most obvious place. And it's on the thing that has most bits. So I've got to undo all these screws and little bits and take that off to be able to respray it. What a pain, but quality control is our watchwords or something. Once the front lens is off, you can see how it works. It's a, it gives a really interesting um, optical illusion, sort of, because you can see them, but actually you're looking at a mirror, 45 degree mirror, that's reflecting them from the outside. And you can see how they're made up of three different layers. A beautiful laser cutter, fabulous. There we are, lovely lead connected, wires inside. And I've also added a 2200 microfarad capacitor, just because this is going to be at the end of the line of the three machines. And with motors switching on and off and things like that, it's just good to have a little bit of reserve electricity, just to keep everything running nicely. And this is why it is such a joy making an oil in the back, because I can get to everything. Just resting on a lovely soft blanket, or blanket, it's a towel by the look of it to stop scratching all of it. So we've got the power, well the power comes in up here somewhere, red and black. Red goes through the fuse and also goes straight off down there to the other socket that's over here somewhere or other. And then we've got the last few um, grounds and plus five volts and four wires left over. What can they be for? Well luckily there are four corresponding ones on four of these tracks. Two of them are for the encoder, one of them is the PIR, and the other one's something else. Oh, the bell motor, that's right. So I'll get them soldered up, and then, that feeling of dread, program it and see what, well, it's actually, I have started programming it, haven't I? Let's see what happens once I've connected these wires. And here we have it. Let my trickery in there, that hangs down and goes off to the power supply, through the pipe through another bendy pipe to go to the scribulator and then through another bendy pipe to go up to the climatic revelator. Looks lovely. Like I've said before, the Victorians were so proud of their engineering, there's no way they would have wanted to hide the power supply, steam pipes, compressed air pipes or whatever. They would have been really keen to show and display everything in the most beautiful way possible. With a bit of luck, they think, oh, Right, I've got the newly painted front bit back on. No blemish, sans blemish. I think, and I've also, yeah, look, I've also realised, where are we? Here we are. Look, I've got a little bit of stick up the back to hold this vertical. I've also made one for this, which I must find again. So they're all vertical, which means, dear friends, I think I could plug them in and see what happens. Shall we do that? Right, lights out, and I'm going to plug them in and get the camera going. Okay, camera on manual settings, so it looks about as bright as it is. Let me try to find the button. Right. What's going to happen? Oh, I can see movement. 
So the clock's finding its feet. Oh, the gauge is lit up. Oh. So all the machines, that strange flickering on the scribulator is because the frequency of the... If I move that actually, is that... There we are. Sort of gone. It's the uh, pulse width modulation running the brightness of the lamp that's just near the camera. So, that's done. Now these have been switched off and unplugged for a day and a night. So I have no idea this is going to be a really good test. So let's have a look at the first one. So, gauge is a light. Brilliant. Tells you barometric pressure. Fabulous. It's not had time to get readings. Um, too many, well, it's had one reading for barometric pressure, but it's predicting it's fair. And I, looking out the window, would agree with that. And it played the tune, which won't be, well, it will be rising or falling, but it won't know quite which way to do it yet, because it hasn't got readings to compare. That looks like an F, and the lovely little flickerings are going on in the little window with the gears. That's nice. An F and an R. This is looking very hopeful because it's a Friday. And what's this done? This has remembered the time. Oh, what a joy. It is 3.14. Oh, I'm thrilled to bits. Right, the next job with this is to get the funny shaped thing round here um, with the magnets, the five little magnets around embedded in it and another magnet in a hole here, which I don't know why I didn't laser cut, but anyway, and that supports it. I mean, it will work like this, but I just, I don't know, it's quite a lot of asking for the mechanism on the switch. In fact, it's absolutely fine, but why leave anything absolutely fine when you can overcomplicate it? Note to self, don't get the jig to mark any of these holes out because they're all wrong. I've had to glue in a couple little bits of dowel to these end ones for a start so this lines up. And it all lined up. Look at the, the jig, the template, was just taken off the CAD drawing. It's always, you've got to be so careful. Even a few little minor differences between a CAD drawing and the real world can end up with all sorts of cumulative errors. So, that's going to go there. I've drilled five little holes and found five beautiful little number two by half inch steel screws. Very old they are. But, they're going to screw through there and then there is a magnet. A very powerful magnet glued into this bit. Do you see what's happening? So, I'm going to spray this up. At least spray the edges of it. And I'm going to cut out two pieces of lovely red felt, as I was mentioning before. Little red details. So that's the red felt's going to be red. You're only going to see the edges of it, but red gem, red spirit level, red control gauge, just a thing. I'll get that painted and get back to you. Look at the lovely shininess of it all. Oh, doesn't that look beautiful? Lovely bit of red felt just glued on there. I've got another bit to go on the bottom. Line this up, now the edges are painted, I'm going to put those five little steel screws in. There we are. Isn't that a delight? And the magnet just helps to hold it in the right positions. And it just looks nice, doesn't it? It's, it's fascinating designing this sort of thing, because I do it on that CAD software, so I can do a visualisation with sort of colour effects and stuff. Just trying to think of a shape that would look right and just... You end up fiddling around with all sorts of different shapes and you just finally um, get to one that is just just looks nice against it. Lovely. Actually, having done that, I think I feel like doing a bit more software. So what's so lovely about these projects? Making stuff, engineering, soldering and programming. It's just fabulous. I think I'll get on with getting some more of these functions working and written. And here's the chronograph clock in bits. I've just been programming it and it was grating. I could hear the minute hand screeching or scratching around. It just wasn't right. So rather, because as I said before, I couldn't get this through the hole, the orifice in the clock gauge. So I just unscrewed every single screw and took the whole thing off, which worked really well. So here's the, ba here's the base with sans everything. There's the front bit. And this means that I could finally get this bit off and I realised that these two wires were just a fraction of a millimetre just rubbing underneath 
the end of that. I mean, it worked perfectly when I was setting up before I would put it together. It's just sod's law. Get everything assembled, and then two days later it starts screw sort of rubbing round. Anyway, I've changed the design. I'll get this back together, and hopefully, well, that will have solved the problem. This is what I'm talking about. I've cut the bigger hole around here, and I've changed the design so that that little post, 12mm diameter, regardless of how high or low this is, will always fit and never rub on it. Oh, joy. There's always something to do. Just realised I'd only I just sold the last of the motorised Kraken gauge kits, so I'm making some more. It's so nice when you finally get round to making a jig, even if it's a bit of wood with some nails sticking up from it. It just makes life so much easier than using lots of little bits of blue tag. Progress so far. Got them decorated, got the pulley glued in with the spacer last night, so I can get the other gears and bits glued in now. But best of all oh i am absolutely thrilled i mentioned i was having all sorts of problems with these pir things triggering because every time it's meant to the scribulator is only meant to draw the date once it sees movement after midnight so when you come down in the morning you can enjoy seeing it right but it, every time i came in here it had already written the day and date and stuff um so I couldn't work it out, I swapped them, I looked at the code, I double checked. Then, walking the dog, I think walking the dog is when some of my best ideas come to me, or memories. I remembered, in the past, solving it by turning down the sensitivity. So, I took them apart, turned the sensitivity down to about half, and would you Adam and Eve it? It works! I came down this morning, filled with trepidation, opened the door, it was all dark, all three machines were dark in fact, no movement seen, which is a good start. It faded up and it wrote today's day, date and month. Oh, what a joy, I'm thrilled, because it was one of those problems I really couldn't work out. I don't know whether this little PIR sensor is detecting muons or whatever it is that scientists spend their time doing at the bottom of deep mine shafts by turning the sensitivity up to 11, who knows? But They've stopped detecting whatever they were detecting, and they're now detecting me. So I'm absolutely thrilled. That means I can just finish programming the clock. It's nearly right setting, which is interesting, but I know why. It's one of those funny things, if statements with an else at the end with no whatever condition on it. You know, you, you think, oh, yeah, that'll work. You don't need to put yet another if statement. You know, if it's pointing at number five, then do this, because you've already taken into account that. But if you add another, an and with your first one, and PIR shows movement, if it doesn't, it's going to fall through the net and it's going to do the else, which is strike preference set, if that makes any sense. It is a joy to program these things, especially when the PIR sensors work. Look, isn't that lovely? I can show you actually, look, let's switch this round to strike preference set. Well, that's not a very good example because I'd set it to <laughs> counting strike, which is exactly where 10 past 11 the time is. Uh, ridiculous. Oh, well. Well, let's uh, set, uh, no, uh, what have we got? Set alarm time. Isn't it lovely the way the hands move? I love the way they move in different directions and end up in the roughly the same time. So that's nice. Display chronograph time. Let's do it the other way. And that's the Excel stepper library, which means it speeds up really nicely in a sort of analog type way and slows down again really nicely. Right, I'll get on. Look and listen. I'm just checking the alarm works. Isn't that lovely? It should ring like that for a minute. Oh, there, look. Yeah, it rang for a minute and then the hands moved to two o'clock. I've also checked and it does stop if you twist that. Oh, how lovely. I'm so pleased. 